It's Saturday the 14th of June 2018. On speaking, speaking to Dr. John Sonnenberg, who turned 90 this year, we're in his flat in Berghof, Upper Hof Street, Oranje Zucht, Cape Town. I'm Herman Lantegen, one of the babies Dr. Sonnenberg delivered 53 years ago. With us is his son Graham, and the producer is Kyle de Villiers. This informal interview is part of an oral history project to preserve Dr. Sonnenberg's legacy for future generations. Dr. Sonnenberg, let's start at the beginning. You were born on the 29th of April, 1928. Can you tell us where were you born, in which hospital, and in which suburb of Cape Town did you grow up? I was born, as you correctly say, on the 29th of April, 1928. I would like to just quote Winston Churchill, who said of his own birth, he said, I was present at the event, but I have no distinct recollection thereof. I grew up in Greenpoint, um, but my father bought the house Morricone, where we were all subsequently housed for many years, a year after I was born. My parents had a flat when I was born in Mully Point. And when I was about five months old, I had a convulsion. I had a temperature and a convulsion. And my mother, in her panic, didn't know what to do. So she took me and held me by my ankles and hung me over the balcony of this flat, hoping that somehow that would control the convulsions. Whether it did or did not, I don't know, but I survived, and I don't think I had any permanent after effects thereof. We moved to a house in Greenpoint in 1929. My father bought the house. It was an old house owned by Mr. Johnston, and it apparently was built in 1858. Uh, my whole childhood, until I grew up and eventually um, graduated as a doctor. During that whole time I lived at Morricone in Greenpoint with the exception of a year when I went to university at Rhodes in 1945. Okay, I just want to ask you, and in which hospital were you born? I was born in the Hof Street Hospital, which is about 20 yards further from where we're sitting right now. Unbelievable. Just above us. <laughs> now, um, tell us about your mother and father. Um, from where did they hail and how did they meet? Um, my mother was born in Malmesbury. And when she was 12 or 13 years old, they moved to... Cape Town, where my grandfather was, uh, had been the, in the divisional council in Malmesbury, but subsequently got an appointment with the old central news agency in Cape Town. And they lived in Mully Point, not far from the lighthouse. Um, and your dad? My father was born in Johannesburg when it was a mining camp. And, uh, his father was also rather itinerant and moved around, and eventually they settled in Tamburskloof, Burnside Road, um, where my father grew up and uh, went to school at Saks. And so how did they meet? Uh, they met in Freiburg. Oh. My, f my uh, mother had been living in Freiburg after she left school, with her elder sister and helping care for her young child. Um, my father had been working in Freiburg as a lawyer, uh, but prior to that he had been in the army and had been in part of the invasion of Southwest Africa when it was liberated from the Germans. Mm. Uh, and thereafter he went back to Freiburg and he met my mother by chance there. Um, they both subsequently came back to Cape Town. My mother worked for 
a firm of lawyers called Fuller de Klerk and Osler, uh, Osler being the father of the famous Springbok flyhof Penny Osler. Um, she worked there as a typist. My father was struggling uh, at, at a law practice, I'm not sure where, uh, but they met, as I say, in Freiburg, and it was a lightning courtship which lasted for about seven years before they finally got married. Now, tell us about your childhood. You had three siblings. Um, tell us about them as children and and also the house that you lived in because there were a whole, I think you, you had grandparents living there as well. So it, was, it wasn't only your, your little family. Um, so let's firstly about the three siblings. Well, the three siblings were 18 months after I was born. My brother Peter was born. Thereafter, after a suitable length, my brother Geoffrey. And then finally, my sister Betty was born in 1932. So my, my uh, mother had four children within five years. Now, and Peter, what happened to him? Well, Peter eventually uh, matriculated uh, at Christian Brothers College, where all three of sons went. Um, he became, uh, he, he went to university and got his uh, degrees. In law. Uh, in law, B-A-L-L-B, and then he uh, joined my father's practice as a, as a young attorney and unfortunately contracted cancer at a very young age. Uh, he was 29 and within eight or nine months he was dead. And how did that affect the family at that stage? Very adversely. I wouldn't like to yes. say anymore. It was a of major course. disaster. My father, I remember distinctly, wore a black tie for about a year afterwards. It had a very, very bad effect on them. Of course. And um, in, in this house, um, it was, you were other, there were other people as well. My mother's parents yes. were in the house. They uh, moved from where they'd been living in Mully Point, and they moved into the house. So there were three generations of us in the house, plus two servants. Okay. So you had the grandparents, the parents, and then the, and then the grandchildren. Yes. yes. Um, and it was obviously quite a big house. It was big. And, and it was big, but it was pretty uh, crowded, especially the, the bath. There was one bathroom, one toilet. Uh, there was outside, there was the, maid, the maid's toilet, which none of us ever used. It wasn't even considered a possibility. Because of those that, years. That, that, yes. Because of the circumstances in those years. Now, so uh, in your childhood then, in this Greenpoint, where you, in Greenpoint where you grew up, um, what did you do, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, in your free time? I know you mentioned once that you went looking for crayfish in Three Anchor Bay, um, the times were different then. You could walk around at night, do whatever you wanted to. What did you tell, tell, take us to your family life? Well, it's spare uh, time. Well, uh, you must remember that Greenpoint was a totally different area in yes. those days. Oh, well, Across there, there was one main road which still exists. Beyond that, from where the traffic department is in Ebenezer Road, as far as where the bowling greens are in Three Anchor Bay, was a series of long parks um, connected by pathways uh, which bisected these parks and which gave access to the common. Mm. Just on the other side of the parks is where the original railway line that used to connect Seapoint to Cape Town was. At the time when I was born, it was still working, uh, but ultimately, I think about a year later, it shut down permanently. A train or a tram? A train, a train, a steam train. Mm. Um, and there we were relics still in my childhood of the platforms and little areas where there'd been rail tracks, although they'd all been removed. Yes. And the common was just one vast open space uh, 
stretching from where the Greenpoint track is today, right as far as Sri Anka Bay. Um, there was only one road through the common called Flay Road, because at the... A gravel road. It was a gravel road, uh, and on the uh, Three Anchor Bay side was the original Flay, where they used to, my mother was a child, they used to have rowing boats and, and small craft that uh, used the Flay, but ultimately the Flay was drained because it was becoming a swamp, Yes. And there was, uh, you know, mosquitoes and that sort of thing. So they, uh, they drained the, the swamp and let the common just develop. And, uh, there were two dairies on the common. One was in Portswood Road, Greenpoint, and the other one was along the main road in, C in Greenpoint. And I remember taking my mother, my grandmother, to her dressmaker who lived in Mully Point. So we walked across the common. Her Grand, uh, my grandmother's dressmaker, interestingly, had the name of Mrs. Mendham. And Mrs. Mendham came into my life subsequently when I was a young doctor, when she was still living in that same property at Mully Point. Um, a very, very badly troubled woman with alcoholism. Anyway, I remember when we were walking with my grandmother, we walked past and through herds of cows on the common. On it the Greenpoint Common. On the Greenpoint Common. It, uh, it afterwards, its function altered. Um, during the war, uh, they used part of it and they had a huge parade and a, a, a fete which went on for about 10 days, about a year before the war ended, raising funds for the war effort. But until maybe the 19, early 1960s, there was nothing left but this bare common until they decided to construct this original stadium just about opposite where we lived. My father was vehemently opposed to the construction of this stadium. He felt the common was for the use of the people and they used to have football matches there and cricket matches from all over and they had constructed a little golf course and he felt that the development of a, a large area devoted and cut off from the use for the general public was wrong. Um, this is not the old Greenpoint Stadium. It was the about. old Greenpoint yes, Stadium. Was then we new. previously yes. had the track which had been there for many, many years. Yes. But this was a new stadium, an athletic stadium. Um, it, it was put to the council and at that time the council had 45 members and the voting for the construction of this stadium was put to the vote and was adopted by 44 votes to one. The one vote being my father, who subsequent to his death had the road named after him, which ironically goes directly past that stadium. Irony is abound. Um, now, you lived in Greenpoint. What I'm also interested in is that York Road area. Now, this was during apartheid, and yet that area was a mixed area. But yes. The Grunehof and York Ho yes. Road. Yes. Close to where you were. Yes, very close. Now, the York Road was uh, inhabited by coloured people. Um, it was originally developed as uh, as a residence for the slaves that worked at the top of York Road in uh, a house, I just temporarily can't remember the name, but um, they were slaves of the yes. of the house, and then ultimately, of course, they set they uh, raised their families mm. there after they were emancipated and so on. So um, that must have been quite interesting to to. You know, to live in, in apartheid South Africa and yet right next to you, you had a, a nice mix of cosmopolitan and Italians and Greeks and everybody in Greenpoint were quite... Oh, Greenpoint was, was a, a very, cosmopolitan very, mix. very mixed area. Well, funnily enough, they were like ghettos because yes. the Italians had once one road, the Irish had another road, 
Uh, it, it was, uh, it was a mixture of people. We had Portuguese people. We had Yugoslavians. Uh, it was uh, quite, yes. a, quite a combination yes. of, yes. Of, of a mixed population. Yeah. Now, what I want, what you come back to is your childhood and what you did in your spare time when you didn't go to school. There was Trianca Bay Beach. You went there. You went playing in, in the water. You, you once said, as I said previously, that you, you caught crayfish and, um, did you go to the beach often? Did you go to yes, only Three Anchor Bay? Yes, we only went to Three Anchor Bay. We used to yes. walk there from our house in Greenpoint. And um, we used to swim there. Yes. Um, they used to have boats there. They had boat sheds. Uh, they now have got mainly canoes and so on. But they had boat sheds. But people used to go out in, in motorboats. Um, and we used to swim there regularly and there was one occasion when my sister Betty who was about five or six uh, mm. got went in too far and she nearly drowned and I had to pull her out and uh, fortunately I was around otherwise she would have she would have drowned now tell us about um, World War two you mentioned that you had black you had to black out the windows the cars could had to black out their um, lights etc. Um, I mean, how did that work? Could you go into the streets? Was there a certain time that you had to black it out? But yes, the blackouts were strictly enforced. I mean, we were, um, unbeknown to many of us, of course, um, there were considerable German U boat activities not far offshore and boats were sunk. Not for so to the blackout was very strictly enforced at what time throughout. Okay. Well, as uh, as soon as it got dark, then you had to put you had black to you, you had to have black curtains, uh, black blacked out completely. Um, I'm not sure whether that applied to the other suburbs like Rondebosch or Weinberg. I don't know. No. but we had the strict blackout. All motor cars had to have a black um, st strip across the headlight, and and the only way that light was projected was through a, 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 a horizontal strip yes. uh, across the headlight, about six inches perhaps wide, um, and it was uh, no one, no one ever drove with their lights on unless they had the blackout thing. It was. They had w wardens that used to make sure, and very often they used to knock at the door uh, and say that your lights are showing, you know, ch through chinks in the curtains. So it was, so it was that serious. Yeah, for, was, for how long did this last? A good few years. I'm every trying to night think. You had to go every through the hole yes. and then inside um, yes. candles. Well, I mean, or what? Was, no, you oh, had so electric normal. light. And then if you wanted to walk in the street, it was pitch, pitch black. Absolutely. To my knowledge, I don't think that there was any major crime as a result. Didn't seem to be. And what about uh, restaurants or places that you want to go to on a Friday night? There were hardly any restaurants in those days. So, well, people, you, you, you know, they, you had to make your own entertainment. And what was that? Playing outside and playing gramophones and children's games and all those kind of things. And pianos and singing yes, along. Yes, people were more, much more musical. Um, sing people, along. See, yes, it was, life was pretty straightforward and simple, actually. <laughs> okay, so you attended CBC in Greenpoint. Two of the people who attended school with you were Dr. Stuart Saunders, ex-Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cape Town as well as the internationally acclaimed actor Sir Nigel Hawthorne. How was the school in those years? Obviously quite small. Which sub subjects did you excel in? And do you remember these two men from those days? Um, I was a foundation pupil at that school. Uh, it was actually f founded in 1935 in a house on the main road that belonged to John Garlick from Garlick's, the famous department store. 
And that is where the school started with a small number of boys. Two years later, they built the school, which is still existent today, with the tower, which is now Redham College. And that opened in 1937, and I was a pupil there in Standard 3 in 1937. At that time, the school consisted, we had about 250 to 300 boys. It was never huge. We, we never had double classes. So when I left the school, uh, when I matriculated, I don't think the school was very much larger than it was when I started. And, Except and they added a standard two. It started at standard three. They added a standard uh, two, which is grade four today, about two years after it was uh, opened. And your favorite subject at school? The, the ones you my favorite for? subject was Latin and, uh, and geography. Those were my two most uh, – I, I, I enjoyed school. We had brilliant teachers. They were Irish. They were temperamental. They were erratic, but they were very good teachers. They and also believed in firm discipline. What, what sport did you excel in? I played both, both rugby and cricket. I played rugby for the first team. Cricket, I was the first team captain. So if you excelled or enjoyed Latin and geography, how did you land up going to study medicine? I also was very uh, interested in chemistry. It was only in the last few months of the trick when I thought I, I think I'd rather do medicine because yeah. my mother had two brothers, both of whom uh, were doctors and who went, who were sent to Edinburgh because in those days they didn't have a medical school here. So I, I, I don't regret for one moment that I chose the right course for my life. And I was very happy and contented to practice for many, many years. Now, I want to go back to your father, who was a powerful, dynamic man, also quite eccentric. He was the mayor of Cape Town, and he started the law firm Sonnenberg Hoffman and Golombic. How did he get involved in the city council? He was interested in the Ratepayers Association. That's how he... Uh, Developed his interest in local affairs, and yes. he was ambitious. I think he would—he was ambitious to take part in public life. But he was hardworking. Yet he liked. Um, I don't know how hardworking he was. Yeah. I don't. I don't know because he was, in fact, I think rather idle. He—he he very often, when we went into his office, he used to be sitting in his office with his feet propped up on his desk. Um, and at five o'clock or half past five, he was sharp. He was off with his friends to go and have drinks. Where would they go? They went to the Langham Hotel in Long Street. That was their place. First, it was the Cape Town Club, which eventually closed down. And then he went to the Langham in Long Street, where they went every night. It was and they smoked cigars or what? So they smoked cigarettes. Cigarettes. They were cigarette smokers. With and my father always used to come home. At half past six or quarter to seven at night, having spent a little while with his friends, primarily to avoid my grandfather, who irritated him intensely and lived with us, and uh, they just didn't get on. My grandfather, who happened to be half Jewish, although he firmly den denied it, was violently anti Semitic. And he couldn't get over the fact that my father, who was a Jew, became a councillor of Cape Town. He didn't survive long enough to see him as mayor because he died during the war in 1943. But uh, you, told, you told me sometimes your, your father would hike to Greenpoint. He would just put his hand on... Oh, when he went to work? Yes. Yes. Well, you know, we had uh, quite severe petrol rationing in the war as well. Uh, and, you know, to, to go to work, he was not so – he used to get out of – stand on the opposite side of the road to our house and just wait and, to see somebody going to town would stop to pick him up. And that always did. Always. It was only a matter of minutes, sometimes less, before somebody he knew stopped to pick him up and gave him a lift. And back home as well. I don't know. He must have got the same sort of thing. One of his mates brought him home. 
So then he became the mayor of Cape Town. And um, you were still at home at that stage. When he became the mayor of Cape Town, I was in my final year of, of uh, university. No, no, I was no, I was in my fourth year. Okay. And how did that change the situation at home? I mean, he was now suddenly the mayor of Cape Town. What happened then? Did he have to work well, harder? Well, the mayor's job then was was mostly ceremonial and pre presiding over strictly municipal affairs at council meetings and committee meetings. So it's a vastly different situation today. So when he was the mayor of Cape Town, were there certain um, goals that he had that he wanted to improve the city or um, work towards some social upliftment of... He, I mean, he was, was a progressive his, man. He, he wasn't was a conservative. Much, he was... Um, when P.W. Butter declared District 6 as a group area, my father was the very first person in the council that day to stand up object violently to this. He had been, when he was elected to the council, it was in 1938, the senior councillor then was a Dr. Abdurrahman. Yes. Dr. Abdurrahman, who was a <coughs> highly respected, uh, he'd been on the council for many years, yes. he married a Scotswoman, um, and his daughter, Sissy Gould, who was a well-known yes, prominent absolutely. activist, was elected to the council on the same day as my father. So my father sat next to Dr. Abdurrahman in the council and was told by Dr. Abdurrahman, keep your mouth shut for three months before you say anything, which he told me when I went to the, when I was elected to the council. Oh. Yeah, I had that in mind. Yes. He was already dead, but I, mean, yeah. I had that in mind. Um, but uh, how did, I don't understand. Just take me to the council. So white and so-called coloured people served together on the council. Yes, they did. Um, until 1972. In 1972, they, rem they were removed from the council and they created uh, what they called management committees for the various areas like Kensington and... Uh, um, Lavender Hill and so on. There were management committees. Yeah, and my, uh, when I was elected to the council in 1972, it was the first all-white council. And so it remained until the change came about. Okay, I want to jump back to your dad. Um, he also loved the horses and going to Monaco and so forth. So he was um, the mayor of Cape Town. He had a legal practice. He was outspoken against um, social injustices, but he had a fun side as well. It seems he was like. very keen on horse racing, and he had horses over the years. Some of them uh, were successful, and some did, some weren't. Um, he enjoyed it. He became a steward, and eventually, uh, you know, running a owners and race course. And ultimately, he was became. Chairman of Tattersalls, which was yes. the head of the bookmaking yes, thing, yes. just to see that all was right. He and really once enjoyed he it. Off to he used to. He was a keen gambler. I only remember when I was young. He told me when in, in his when he was in Johannesburg working. This must have been in the early twenties. He used to gamble with a friend of his, who was his great friend from here, and they used to gamble. And when they won, they used to put the gold coins in their socks. So, in case they were were mobbed or, or robbed, uh, and they were keen gamblers, and eventually they were regulars. They used to go to Monaco every on year the, on the Union Castle line. No, they flew. Oh. they used to fly, and uh, my father got involved, and they used to go every year with them. And the highlight used to be Princess Grace of Monaco's ball, Red Cross ball. And one year, when Chris Barnard was famous, became famous, he was invited as well. And he stood next to my father in the anterooms of the Monaco Palace with its ornate furnishings and all the glitter and so on. And my father said to him, because he'd met 
my father through me when I was working at a, at the hospital. I worked with him. And my father was standing next to me and said, what do you think of this, Barnard? He says, it's a bit different from the Orient Cafe in both West. That was his <laughs> response. But back to your dad, there was some sad thing that happened with him and Pete van der Beyl. What was the story there? He was an MP. My father was, uh, in 1947, was elected to the Provincial Council, which is now the Western Cape government. For years, he had had an ambition for, to go further. But the occupant at the time was the town clerk, or some of you, his name is Finch. Anyway, my father, he died and my father was elected to the provincial council. Um, and a year later was the general election where General Smuts was defeated. Yes. And, the Nazi and amongst family. the people who lost their seats, including General Smuts, was Pitt van der Bale, who had been uh, the Member of Parliament for Caledon. So the sitting member for Greenpoint was a man called Bowen. He was a, an advocate who was um, blinded in the First World War. And my father, although he had ambitions to become a Member of Parliament, on principle, would, wouldn't stand against Bowen. It so happened that Bowen died within a month of this general election where Smuts was defeated, and the seat of Greenpoint became vacant, and my father put his name up, and being the sitting member of the Provincial Council, he was clearly a natural person to occupy the seat. However, General Smuts uh, uh, then uh, General Smuts said to Van der Bale, who'd been defeated, there is a vacant seat. Uh, I think you, you should make yourself available for that seat. So he did. And my father then said he was going to oppose him. He felt he, you know, he had more claim to have the seat than Van der Bale. And it all set to have a a very bitter nomination battle. Um, when it was clear that it looked like my father was going to beat Van der Bale, they then decided General Smuts, um, J.H. Hoffmeyer, who was the Vice Premier, Max Sonnenberg, who was my father's uncle, the founder of Woolworths, was the MP for False Bay, Musenberg, and A.B. Bloomberg, who was the mayor of Cape Town. Those four men tried to persuade my father to stand down in favor of Van der Bale. So ultimately, my father realized, he said, I'll do it on one condition, that when the next election comes, Mr. Major Van der Bale goes back to Caledon and tries to win his seat back. So that was the agreement, and my father stood down. When it came time for the next election, my father got in touch with Van der Bale and said, in terms of the agreement that we reached, um, I expect you to honor your obligation and to go back. He said, what obligation? I didn't give an obligation. However, my father was, of course, taken aback by this, the extent was, he said, well, then I'll, I will actually oppose you uh, and I'll see how I can do it. My father then, by then General Smuts had died, J.H. Hoffman had died, Max Sonnenberg was in his dotage. He was old and he retired and A.B. Bloomberg couldn't remember about the meeting. So that he, 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 Van der Bale said he gave no obligation 
and eight Babby Blinberg couldn't remember. The other three were dead. So my father fought a nomination battle against. Van der Baal got trounced uh, and was extremely bitter. He was punished to the extent that when the next provincial election came, he wasn't selected as the candidate. So for about eight years, he was in the wilderness. And ultimately, he in the early 60s, he was almost 70 years old when he won the seat back again. He was the candidate and won the seat. The first, interestingly, the first election fought by the old Progressive Party. My father was United Party. And that was the last time I voted for the United Party. He won the seat and he died uh, with his uh, political boots on. He was in, he was a sitting councillor for 31 years and he died after nine years or so, or many more in the, in, the, in the provincial council. You first went to Grahamstown and then UCT. While, while you were in Grahamstown, did you come to Cape Town during that period? How did you get here? Is that where you met Pam Golding? So, and why did you go to Grahamstown first? I went to Grahamstown because I, having matriculated at the age of 16, my father said, I said, I'd like to go to the army, bluff my age. I mean, it was absurd, really. But that's what I did. He said, no, no. He said, what you can do is, you've never lived out of this house in Greenpoint. He says, you're going to go away for a year um, and learn how to live on your own. Um, meantime, I had been accepted at the University of Cape Town, and I'd actually got a, won a bursary for my trick, matric results. However, my father said he used to go away, so he decided to send me to Rhodes. And I had, I enjoyed it very much. I've had a lovely, most enjoyable year there, and I did quite well academically. Um, and uh, I was rather sorry that, I mean, I, I did the entire first year med medicine course at Rhodes, which was actually more comprehensive than the first year here at UCT, and I passed very well, and when it came for the time to me to enter the university here for the second year, I was uh, refused admission to the medical school unless I went back to do the first year all over again, because it was the first intake of students who were ex-servicemen who had been in the war who were mature, mostly in their early 20s, um, and they got preference, and there was no extra places. So, um, I mean, I was highly indignant and most upset that I'd have to go and do all this over again. What for? It was pointless. Um, and J. H. Hoffmeyer arranged John Hendrick, yeah. for me to see the dean of the Faculty of Medicine, who was a Professor Ryrie, who was a very dour Scotsman. And I uh, went to interview him, and he said to me, he says, what do you know about the history of your profession, boy? I said, not very much, so He says, well, go and read it up for a year. So for a year, I didn't read up the... Uh, the history of my profession. I went to the university. I found it very easy and easy to cope with, so much so that I got involved with these fellow first year students who were fairly experienced boys who'd been in the war in Italy and so on. And I got into funny habits, one of which was I was quite a good golfer, even as a boy, because we had a golf course opposite. We are taught by caddies. So uh, every Friday afternoon for six years, I had I put my golf clubs in the boot of my car 
and I, instead of going to medical school on Friday afternoons, I played golf for six years. <laughs> My mother never, ever found out. She used to say on Friday, how did you get on today? I said, oh, very well. She never knew. Uh, it didn't do me any harm because um, I found that the subsequent years at medical school, I was never a brilliant student. I was above average. And I passed all my exams successfully, and eventually I graduated with ordinary results. But, but good, how, good come, enough. how come you matriculated at 16? How did you jump? Well, I went to, when I went to school, I went first to a private school in Greenpoint called Upton Villa. There's a block oh. of flats there today. And mm. it was a private school run by a friend of my mother's, was a, uh, a Mrs. Perold. And uh, I went there and I was taught, uh, I went through sub A and sub B in one year. So I was actually a year younger when I uh, eventually ended up at, at uh, university, a year younger than most of them. Most of them were 17 or 18, I was 16. And you said that you went to the golf in, in your car. What car was it? I had a, a Ford Prefect. Old Ford Prefect. What year? What model? And then I had a Morris 8. It was a, a, I had a Morris 8 in 1947. Um, I, I happened to win. My, my Ford Prefect gave me infinite trouble. It always used to break down. It was a pre-war model. Broke down twice when we went to Joburg in it. It's a long story. But it was interesting that um, how I got my Morris 8. Um, my father, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is very keen on horse racing, and he was a horse in his uh, stable belonging to another guy called Desert Rat. And Desert Rat was 66 to 1. So I said to my father, can't I have a bet five pounds on this horse? He says, right. He says, we'll see. If it loses, you give me the five pounds. Anyway, it, it was a form horse, and it got better and better, and the odd shortened. Eventually, it won the, it won the Metropolitan, and I won 330 pounds, and the Morris Minor cost 349 pounds. So that's how I acquired <laughs> the Morris, which lasted me for many years, but which I was ashamed to take my future wife in, because I, although she... The first time I took her out, I felt that she would be sort of slightly disappointed at this car. So I borrowed the Chev Fleet Master belonging to my best friend, Ori Cohen, and I took her out for a drive. And it was a Saturday night, and I took her as far as Hout Bay and back, and I led her back at Krutzke Hospital Nurses. No gefuffling went on. It was just a drive around, and... Uh, <laughs> Thereafter, we used the Morris for years. So, while you were at UCT, you also worked in District 6. Tell us about that. What, what happened? Well, that was part of the training. Yes. That was part of the obstetrics and gynecology training, <coughs> where you had to go and live in District 6 for a month, where they had a boarding house there, which was run for the medical students next to the Peninsula Maternity Home in Caledon Street, which has since been demolished. Near just the Ethel Fugard Theatre. On the opposite side of the road, just a bit higher up. It's now a parking lot. Yes. That was the Peninsula Maternity Hospital, the ramshackle, run-down old place, but the mecca for, for obstetrics. It, uh, all the best people worked there. Um, and, and you go and, into the homes of... People living oh, yes, we did six. to do deliveries, but we, we lived at this house run by a Mrs. Jasper, which was uh, 100 yards away. Where there were about six of us at a time that you stay in there. It was a, full of bed bugs and a bloody awful place. Um, and we used to take solace in drinking down the road at a place called the Castle Arms, which is still in existence still today. Um, and... Uh, Funnily enough, Mrs. Jasper had a husband, Mr. Jasper, who was the caretaker of the toilets on the common down Flay Road, where I used to walk with my grandmother. Um, 
and uh, one, I'll tell you an interesting and funny story. One of my friends, there was a chap called Riceborough. He was an ex-serviceman, quite a heavy drinker, uh, and a very mediocre student. Um, anyway, uh, we used to sit on the pavement, because it was too terrible inside this house. We used to sit on the pavement afterwards before going to the drinks or when we came back. And we were sitting on the pavement one day, and Mrs. Jasper comes out and sees us sitting on the pavement. She says, Mr. Riceborough, she says, why are you sitting on the pavement? So he said, because I like sitting here. So she said, well, you know what will happen to you if you, st if you sit on pavements? He said, what? She said, you'll get piles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once you finish your studies, Tell us about your first job with the old city hospital. No, that wasn't my first job. Wasn't that? So, no. okay, what I want to then find out is the the timeline, because you went to practice on your own at some stage. There was Morris Hellman, yes. Dave Allman. So just take us through till when you met up with Solly, from no. the moment you left uh, when I went to when I when I graduated, I spent a year at Grootskier Hospital. Okay, is that where you met my internship? That, that I'd, we... I'd, I'd, I'd met Jerry, my wife, uh, while I was a student, fifth year student at Grootskier. Yes. So after I'd finished my internship, I did six months at at the city hospital for infectious diseases, uh, where I got very interested in the work there. I liked it. But after six months, I had to move on. I was just a, a houseman. So I helped out Morris Hillman as a, an assistant for six months. Where was he in Seapoint? In Greenpoint. Okay. In Greenpoint. After that time, a job fell vacant at the city hospital as a, a senior houseman. Like a, yeah which I was very keen to accept and which I did. And that is how I spent nearly four years of my life there after that, during the time in which we had a major polio epidemic and many, many serious illnesses which uh, have vanished from the world today. Yes, the vanishing diseases. Yeah. And then from there, how did you... So until you met Solly, what happened after the city hospital? After the city hospital, uh, which I left because um, I already then had two children. And, I, you know, it was, although we had um, accommodation which was provided, it wasn't enough. I wasn't making enough to, to live properly. And my father bought this house. 25 Main Road, Greenpoint, um, and uh, I paid him off over the years and got a loan as well, and Morris Hellman, who lived four down, four road, a few, few houses corner, down yeah. the road, was looking for uh, an assistant with a view, or a junior partner. So I joined him in 1959, that was when I left the city hospital. In 1957, I left the city hospital and I started to practice on my own, using my mother's bedroom <laughs> as my surgery and enclosed the stoop as the waiting room and my parents were banished to another bedroom. That's how I started and, and uh, Morris Hillman then was keen to take someone else on because he was busy, so I then joined him in 1959 as a junior partner where I worked for six or seven years. We've been talking a lot about various stuff, your background, your childhood, your studies. Um, tell us more about your wife, Jerry Sonnenberg. You met at Grutteskir Hospital and then... Um, she was an integral part of your life for many, many years. I think I even went to your 50th wedding anniversary, which was at the Rosanoff restaurant. What role did she play in your life as a doctor, as a husband, as a father? 
she was part of my life. I would never have got to where I ended up if it hadn't been for her. Um, I had a, a wonderful relationship with her because she was so modest and she was so helpful. I mean, her nursing experience was extremely useful to me because she dealt with the patients who phoned who took took her into their confidence and she was able to give advice and she was extremely helpful, especially dealing with people who were very worried or people who were angry or people that felt that they uh, that they weren't getting enough attention and so on. She was very, very helpful. Not only in that, in my municipal and my political career, she was indispensable. She did everything and went beyond that, and she was the, the most modest person I've ever met. The most understand, she was really, um, and she came from a tough background. Uh, but she was, uh, I, I can't imagine how I would ever have achieved what I did without her. It wouldn't have been possible. Yes. And, uh, you know, losing her after 60 years, it was quite a blow, although her last years were really, very, very unpleasant for her. And uh, I did whatever I could to alleviate her problems, and uh, she was number one in my life no. and irreplaceable. And you had three children um, with Pamela, now Penny being the first, and then Pamela, and then Graham. And you all first lived in, as a family, all four or five of you in, in Greenpoint in, in number 25. Yes. And then you moved to Yilbra, the house Yilbra in Frenay. The one we bought in Frenay. Yes. yes. We were there for 20 years. And that is where you then also ran your practice with Solid Son at the same time you got involved with the city council. How did that he happen? was no. He I took him in in uh, when I left Morris Hillman in 1966. I left after seven years because I really found that the work was not pleasant anymore. There was too much of it, and he was giving me a lot of extra work. And and I eventually decided um, that I didn't want to stay. And Jack Mervis, who was a a GP in 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 Seapoint was very friendly with me. We were met, we we met uh, many years before at the golf course, and he was a he was an ideal uh, person to work with. Very very uh, he was very straight and 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 a most honourable man. Yes, and I worked for him. For well, it was the happiest time in my life in practice. Those with four years I was with him. Really? And he, yeah, it was just we were very well suited to each other. And uh, he, after, when he was 55, he'd been in the war, he'd been in Burma, uh, and he was, he, he was finding general practice a bit heavy. It was because one had to travel around a lot and it was, there were lots of house calls and we had patients all over, so he decided he'd rather go for some more, uh, something a little bit more uh, peaceful. So he got a job at Hrutskia looking after the nurses. That was in 1970, and um, I then uh, was on my own for a few months and, until I found that it was just impossible for me to cope on my own. And that's where Solly came into it. Actually, I can't remember exact circumstances how he got to me, but um, Jack Mervis vetted him. He says, that's the guy you must have. And, and Solly you know, joined me in 1970, and we worked together for over 45 years. Um, sure. He was at first a junior partner, then a full partner, and I would never, ever have been able to engage in my political and municipal life if it hadn't yes. been for him. Because so how did that happen? How did you get involved with the city council? 
I got involved with the city council because I'd been on the Ratepayers Association and there was a, uh, an election in 1972, which is the one where they removed the colored people from the row. Uh, and uh, they had a new council. It was reduced from 35 to 40, to 34, from 45 to 34. And uh, I was, at my, I, I was, at, and there were two councillors per ward. So I was elected as one of the councillors in Seapoint. And for how long did you? I was on the council until 1994. Over 20 the, years? 20, 22 years on the council. And in 1977, uh, I stood for the Progressive Party in Greenpoint for the provincial council. Uh, I was actually the, um, I was originally, um, asked to become the Member of Parliament, yes. uh, but it would have absolutely destroyed my practice, so I would, uh, I, I just couldn't cope with the idea of having to give up a practice and go into politics full-time, so I did it through the Provincial Council where we met three or four times a year and did work in between, but I was able to manage with the help of a partner to cope both with my municipal and my uh, political life, as well as my keeping up my practice. So that was one hell of a, I mean, you had to balance quite a, a lot of things. You had a family, um, you had your practice, and you had the council, plus you were on various um, charitable Organizations like um, this hospital around the corner. I was, I was on the booth. The uh, booth. The, I was the chairman of the booth for six years. I was on the board for thirty-two years. So the board of the Somerset Hospital. So how did you do? Jerry obviously played a big role there. As well. That used to be after in the evenings. Yes. That's kind of all the, on afternoon. I managed yeah. that. So all of that. Yeah. And then you had some colourful friends. Um, such as Tuttle's Lipschitz, Mike Friedman, and then you told me once about a car dealership in town where you went to for drinks sometimes. Arnie Weinstein. Yes. Arnie, 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 yeah. What, what was that? It was 10, the top 10. Top 10. Top 10 every week he had yeah. the top 10 cars. Yeah. So on a Thursday you would go there. Thursdays Off we used to go to Barney Greenstein's shop in Watercan Street and his brother Solly lived over the road. And Norman Lieberman, who had a refrigerator shop ne next door to that, there were about six of us that used to go on a Thursday. At after golf? No, it's after I stopped playing golf. Okay. I stopped playing golf after I had a back operation. That's what I did instead of playing golf. The city council, um, on which you served for many years, what do you feel you achieved there? And in, in, if you look back, on that period, what? Well, I, I, it's hard to to sum up after twenty two years. But what I did manage on a couple of occasions was to help people individually. I certainly remember two people who lived in District Six, um, who were to be evacuated and demolished and had nowhere to go. I managed to arrange for them to have housing. In uh, in council housing elsewhere, I'm not quite sure where. They, I can't remember. One was uh, a blind guy. The other was a relative of someone that worked for 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 me. And uh, it was really a matter of dealing with individuals and trying to help them with difficulties they may have encountered with uh, officialdom. Um, Basically, the council became more and more politicized over the years, and uh, you had a conservative element and a, a liberal element. The liberals, I think, were in the majority, as they appear still to be, um, but uh, the portfolios that I was involved in with the council were mainly concerned with health and, and um the provision of open space and and, and playing fields. So um, and also the ambulance service. 
the council clinics. Um, there was plenty of uh, work that is part of one's routine as a as an elected uh, uh, person uh, that one has to deal with, and I managed, I think, to cope with most of the things that I did uh, adequately. Sometimes not successfully, but I did as best as I could. When I was on the provincial council, my matters were more widespread. They were confined to health matters, not only in in in, in uh, Cape Town, but throughout the whole of the Cape Province, which included Port Elizabeth, East London, Kimberley, and afterwards for three years, Southwest Africa, Vintook, uh, not Vintook, sorry, Wolfis Wolf Wolf Bay. Bay. Walfish Bay, which uh, I had to visit three or four times a year to, to, to inspect the schools and the libraries and the council premises and the hospital. And it was very gratifying work. I enjoyed it. It was my field. It was largely non-political. And uh, it was, I hope that I managed to contribute something. Yes. Put something back into society. Yeah. When you went to Vintuk, did you fly over to uh, Walfus Bay? Did you fly to Vintuk and then drive? No, to we flew direct? directly to to uh, Walfus Bay. Oh, okay. Finally, you've moved back. You, or you've not moved back, but you've moved into Berghof. You've given up your practice about two years ago. Am I correct? Yes. You've had a rich and varied life. You still do. You were also. Um, the chairman of the city orchestra. I was. I'm no yes. longer. I was, I was. I was a member of the board yes. of the orchestra for 25 years. And um, you also went overseas to a few times with, uh, with the, I think, with the orchestra. And I went twice on tours of school children, yes. 400 school children, as the doctor, as the doctor to Europe. Yes, um, for uh, six weeks two occasions, and I went with the symphony orchestra when we were invited by the government of Taiwan to give concerts there, and we went there and to Hong Kong. Uh, looking after 80 musicians was just, just as difficult as looking after 400 children. So uh, anyway, it was interesting, and I enjoyed it, and it uh, added a certain element of difference to my life. Yes, variety. Yeah. Apart from the ordinary, I won't call it humdrum activities, but the routine activities of general practice. Yes. But, okay, before I get to the end, I want you to ask you about your um, the profile of your patients that you had. How, what sort of patients did you attract? Them? All sorts. Yes. I had quite a lot of domestic servants, patients. Very good ones. I had communities, Italians, Greeks, um, Afrikaans people. I had, I had an Afrikaans practice, which not, wasn't huge, but I don't think I spoke a word of English in 30 years to them. They were the most loyal patients of all. They, um, generally speaking, general practice is a a mirror of life, really, which most people don't have the privilege of seeing. What goes on behind the doors, what the state of the house is like, what the relationships are. One has to be, as a, as a general practitioner of my ilk, it's quite different today. You're given a limited amount of time with the doctors. Yes. If, if you're sick enough to ask for a house call, then you must rather go to the hospital because the hospitals will probably have to cope anyway. So the amount of house calls has vanished. People go to the doctor and they have a limited appointment. So there's that loss of knowledge that you get to know people not only as patients but as persons. I used to, when I had to go to a new patient, it was always a thing that I used to look at. The first thing I came is when I came at the gate, I used to look at the garden. And if I saw an untidy garden, I expected to find a house that wasn't completely tidy either. And every single time I was right. Um, you get to know people's lives intimately. 
You keep secrets which you never disclose to anybody. And it's the confidentiality as well as the intimacy of the relationship between the doctor and the patient that's disappeared. Today, when a patient is examined, they hardly take a history. They don't know that there might be a, a drunk wife in the, in the household or a son that's on drugs or a child that's been doing badly at school that can affect one's state of health, one's feeling of wellness. Um, these are factors that you can't write in uh, unless you've got the history and you know the person or get to know the person properly. You aren't in a position to make an adequate diagnosis. There are two things that are most important. The history person is telling you a story. It's an intimate story. You have to listen. And you only ask questions when you feel you're in any doubt. You do not prompt them. And secondly, an examination of the patient completely. If that isn't done properly, you failed in your job. And what does that entail, the complete image of um, Well, it depends, actually. Uh, for example, um, you, you know, the one thing one, one, one does always, I was taught to you, always look at the person's hands. You look at the hands to see. You also look at their feet. Apart from doing their blood pressure and listening to their chest and feeling around, you, you look out for things. It's uh, and you got what I mean with the modern technology. It's been it's so much easier. Yes. We had to learn when you didn't have all these high tech uh, additional uh, facilities that uh, at, at uh, available with scans and MRIs and all that. It's made life such a lot easier. But at the same time, the way we were taught as students. 60, 70 years ago, how to examine a patient has disappeared. It's not necessary anymore, so they don't do it. I still believe it is, that you should be able to form some sort of idea and resort to special investigations where the need arises, not just as a general blanket thing. But uh, it's, it's a sign of the times, and it's a sign, of course, the, with the development of, of, of high tech and especially robots today in medicine, it's astonishing in the space of my lifetime, the changes that have been taking place and are going to take place. When we were at medical school, we hardly knew anything about genes. We just knew about Mendel's theory when you had beans where you could... Uh, it, 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 the science of genetics was unknown. And uh, I mean, ask me now, what's the most important advance that's been made in the last 50, 60 years? I would say three things. Firstly, the pill, the contraceptive pill. Secondly, the development of more sophisticated antibiotics. Thirdly, of all the operations, the one that's benefited the most people, the most, I believe, is the hip replacement operation. The development of modern anesthesia and, and modern surgery and intervention with uh, catheterization, with robots, uh, with the enormously detailed uh, investigations that you can do are simply astounding and I mean it's, a, it's been a revelation to me and it's been a great privilege to have practiced medicine for 60 years in an evolving, civilizing type of way. <laughs>